Welcome to today's um, Open Borders webinar. My name is Nicole Thiara and I would like you uh, to welcome you to this first Zoom Open Borders webinar that we have in this series. We had a, a, a formations one earlier in the year and this one has the intriguing title Reflections on Caste and Art in the Diaspora and I think this is our first proper webinar on art, so we're really super excited. <laughs> so the session will be led and organized by uh, Anisha Palat, who's a PhD candidate in the history of art at the Edinburgh College of Art at the University of Edinburgh, and the artist Kirtika Kane, who examines caste and identity through her powerful works of art based on her experience with caste as a woman raised in Sydney, Australia, and those of you who were on our list you know, there saw this wonderful image on the, on the poster that Marina created. So we're so delighted to have them talk about their work in a conversation that highlights the importance of collaborative exchanges between artists and art historian and art critic, which is so intriguing um, when it comes to analysing and writing about art and art practices. And, you know, these sessions are all about interesting dialogues. Yeah, so we're really, really, really pleased. As always, the webinar series is organised by Marina Rimsha from the India and Indonesia programme at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Judith Misrahi Barak from the Research Center EMA at the University of Paul Valéry, Montpellier 3, and the Postcolonial Studies Center at Nottingham Trent University. So please be aware that the session is being recorded and will be upload, uploaded sorry, to our YouTube channel on page on stage. Um, Judith is going to say a few words about how she and Anisha met, and then Anisha and Kirtika will just kind of take it over from there. And towards the end, there will be you know, opportunities for you to ask questions. Thank you. Yes, hello to everyone. Uh, greetings, you know, we're straddling, I mean, four different time zones. So this is quite acrobatic in many ways. Uh, but the, um, you know, the few words I want to say uh, are meant for um, Sarah Abraham, because I want to thank her. Uh, for having introduced me in the first place to Anisha. And then, you know, when I was in Chennai a few, a few months ago, uh, and then we started, you know, talking, we kept the conversation uh, going, and then Anisha actually introduced us uh, to Ketika, and then, you know, uh, this webinar is, is happening now. So this is very representative of how the network has been functioning. Uh, and this is, you know, one of the very nice um, aspects. So thank you, Sarah. I know you can't be here uh, today, but I know you will catch up. Uh, so you will hear those, uh, you know, thanks and uh, words of acknowledgement later on. And thank you to Anisha and Kirtika as well. And of course, to the network. So we all look forward to the conversation. Hey, um, so thank you so much for those lovely introductions and um, Kitika and I are very excited to be here and have this conversation today um, uh, and be part of this open borders because the other other uh, videos that I've watched have been absolutely uh, fascinating and I've learned so much so it's it's a great honor to be a part of that conversation. Um, I want to thank uh, Judith, Nicole, and Marina for inviting us, uh, and and also of course Sarah Abraham, who's not here, but again for putting me in touch with Judith. Um, and I also want to thank Kitika because uh, we've had a growing relationship over my over the course of my PhD, and I'm coming to the end of it, and it's been very enriching to learn from her work and learn about caste through her work. And I hope that we can highlight that today through our conversation. Um, so just, uh, so like, uh, like Nicole said, I'm Anisha, I'm a fourth year PhD student at the University of Edinburgh. And I am in the final stages of my PhD. And I look, I'm looking at how contemporary artists from India and the diaspora represent the cow in their artworks especially in relation to caste and animal studies. Um, and so I'm looking at how I can bring these perspectives together. Um, so I'll let Kitika introduce herself and then we'll get going. Hello everyone. Thank you, Anisha. And thank you, Marina, Judith and Nicole for not only inviting us, but for creating this incredible archive that can be accessed on YouTube. I've it's very, been very moving to watch um, some of the other uh, clips you have. So thank you for this. And just before I begin, I just want to acknowledge that um, uh, I want to acknowledge the Darug people, the traditional custodians of the land that I'm calling from here today in Australia, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. 
um, who are who are joining us online. And I myself, I'm an artist who works on Darug country in Sydney's west. And but I was born in India and I was born into the Dalit caste. Both my parents uh, are Dalit as well. And I migrated with my family in 1993 to Australia. And I guess um, my art practice is really a way to investigate the nature of what caste inheritance is. Um, and I think unraveling the questions through materials in a studio and unpacking the political, the personal, the social, historical, the religious, and putting that investigation into an art practice, um, which we'll be unpacking today. Okay, so this um, this talk is designed as a conversation between us. It's supposed to be open and um, kind of reflects uh, the way I interviewed Kirtika for my fieldwork, um, for my thesis. And um, so we're just going to, I'm going to ask her some questions and she'll give answers and she'll ask me some questions. And um, it just is a reflection of our, our collaboration. Um, we first met online in January 2021. And so our relationship has grown from then. Um, and, you know, I was intrigued by her work because I read about it in a magazine um, and uh, her work is very striking. So I thought before we, I mean, we're not, we're, we're going to talk about her work in detail later, but just to give you an idea of what her work um, looks like, I thought uh, I'm just going to share my screen and show you uh, just an idea. So, um, yeah, this is uh, this is some of her work, um, which was part of the Luna Line series. Am I right, uh, Kiltika? Yes, that's yeah. correct. Yeah, um, and um, we're not going to talk in detail about these, but this is just to give you an idea of the kind of colors and textures and material that she uses and what her work looks like. So you can keep this um, in your mind as we speak, and then we'll get back to the work later. So, uh, okay. Um, so uh, I thought before we, you know, get dive right into the work, a bit of uh, um, exploring Kirtika's background in a little bit more detail might be um, interesting and it is relevant to understanding her work as well. So to start off with, um, Kirtika, I want you to kind of talk us through how you became an artist, your move to Sydney. Um, if you could share a bit about your journey then, what it is like um, being an artist in the diaspora, um, I think that would be a good starting point for us. Yeah, of course. Um, I think my my art and my practice and I guess the reflection on caste comes foremost from my parents. So my father was a beneficiary of reservation um, and he came to Australia through his um, skills and talents in the hospitality industry and when when he came here he didn't tell us well we we didn't speak about caste because um, the main thing to know about caste is that it travels in the diaspora wherever you find the Indian diaspora you will find caste and it was a way of I guess protecting us and not because we lived with other Indian families and it was a way to not um, give us a sense of of who we were but also to not give them a sense of of that either and there was one instance where one of the the people we were living with, one of the other Indians did find us find out about our caste and started to treat us differently and I think that that kind of um when I was growing up and when I when we came to Australia I was in a very um Anglo part of Sydney where there were very few migrants so I think that kind of sense of of otherness really started I think in that sense feeling like feeling like a migrant and 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 that but I think that um when it comes to caste um my father didn't really speak about it but once his duties as a parent like when when I was in my 20s he became very involved in a lot of the Dalit organizations in Sydney so the Guru Ravidas Sabha and other community groups in Sydney that he became a, a, a very prominent member of and I think his his feelings towards our caste identity changed and it shifted a lot. So there was a lot of rage that started to come into how he felt and the way that he was processing this. And I, so I grew up grew up in Sydney. I actually studied psychology first. And when I, um, after that, I, I went into art school because I, there was always this sense, I think, that, you know, or sense of creativity that wanted to be unleashed. And when I arrived at art school, there was a sense of like, what is 
what is it that that's in, that is so important to imbue into my art practice? And I couldn't get away from this caste question. And I think it was also at that same time when my father was beginning to think about what caste meant for our family and and what he had hidden from us. And I could see his his influence kind of seeping into my own practice. And I think um, I think that sort of really influenced my work. And um, but it, and I think the the work I do now is sort of an ongoing unpackaging of that, and not kind of thinking about it as a construct or a story, but my own investigation of it, like what how it has been uh, taught, how it has been kind of embodied and and putting all of that into my own art practice, I think is the the basis of what I do in the studio. And it often comes out in quite cathartic, quite powerful, quite, um, you know, abrupt ways, which is I'm still beginning to learn. Um, but yeah, I think that's kind of the backbone of my practice. My parents informed that a lot. Right. Um, yeah, I think um, I've, uh, when I'm writing about your work, I've kind of talked about these experiences as personal histories and also collective histories that you kind of inherit. And while you've described some of your, your personal histories and especially your relationship with your father and how that has kind of influenced you. And then also later when we talk about one of the works, it's kind of a collaboration with your mother, which I think is quite interesting. Yeah. Um, but uh, can you, uh, so there's also the aspect of a collective history. So you read a lot about caste. You, so you've grown, out, grown up in Australia, which is a former colony. Um, so can you talk a little bit about that aspect of how, other than from hearing stories from your parents and your family, how else have you um, uh, been, how, how have you informed yourself about caste and have, has it been through conversations with other artists uh, or other people, through reading, um, what have been your inspiration? Yeah, I think that's a good question because, like, I think the collective history, when you when you grow up in the diaspora and you consider caste, there's just such a sense of fragmentation around it. You know, like you, you're trying to make sense of a system that's, that is just so barbaric and inconceivable. And, and then also it's like, I think there's a lot of gaslighting as well you know people downplay the severity of it or like you know you're you're no longer part of that or you're but I think trying to understand the the traces of it makes sense of it and and understand the realities and understand you know, and also face that kind of wall of silence that comes with caste um and and even even you know with one's own family trying to under, understand and get a trace of what it looks like what it you know how it can possibly be and and getting a shape of it I think I think the a lot of my work is, um, as as you were saying before, is shaped by personal history because I think when you live in the diaspora, you kind of try to build those fragments from what you can actually see, which is your own parents' lives and your own kind of, um, you know, the way that they've inherited and and worked through caste. But I think the collective history comes a lot from literature for me, and I think that um, fortunately, um, you know, the lit has the lit history has an incredible literary tradition and I read a lot from that and try to understand and I think as an artist being fueled by the enormity of that literature um I find that really really forms a picture for me and also informs the work as well because it's it's the ability to access that and read it and to feel it and to actually understand or begin to get a trace of these fragments and to make sense of them I think that I do lean a lot on literature and find a lot from there yeah no that that makes a, that makes a lot of sense and for me when I'm hearing um these personal histories and you know these collective histories the collective histories um become easier for me to write about because I can also read what you're reading and um, oh. develop my own understanding. But your personal histories, I'm re relying a lot on what you're saying, and I have to um, be very sensitive to uh, to acknowledging what that means for you, um, both as an yeah. artist and also as an individual experiencing that. And um, you know, my own positionality and sensitivity as someone who's who's not a Dalit. How am I? How do I write about? your lived experiences, your narratives, 
um, and you know uh, be be extremely uh, sensitive, but not you know uh, but not you know I don't want to make it uh, I don't want to trivialize your experiences, you know. Um, oh, so nice. that's it's it's a it's a fine balance between uh, between those two things, um, and so I think for me the what i've learned from listening to you over the last couple of years is that uh, a lot of art writing especially about you know uh, living artists who are developing their practice and your practice has changed even in the years that i've known you um it's it's a lot about this collaborative space between someone who's writing about you and your own experiences and while all i op- I have to employ a critical lens while writing about your work. It's so important for me to also acknowledge those lived experiences, those personal histories, those collective histories, and the inheritance of all of that. Um, so yeah, uh, I, 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 and I've always been very inspired by your voracious reading of Dalit literature. You've given me so many good recommendations, um, and you know. I think when we first spoke, you were very, you were reading a lot of Ambedkar, you were reading Bebitai Kamble, you were reading even the Manusmriti, which is not Dalit literature, but it's informed so much of of the whole caste system, essentially. Um, and then I think later you expressed interest in the writings of Babura Bagul, and you had made a lot of works inspired by that. Um, and I think what's really interesting for me is how you've combined the personal and the collective. So they're not they're not separate. You you've made it uh, one collective. No, I, I, sh- I shouldn't use the word collective again, but essentially it's your own um, history that comes out in 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 your work. And we've spoken about it before as kind of like a living archive that you are creating and um, and that is growing and developing uh, currently. Um, so yeah, I I want to talk a little bit about how you you these personal and collective histories, the way you bring them out in your art is a lot um, through materials because that is something that you work with a lot. Um, so can you talk a little bit about how what are the kinds of materials you use? Why do you choose certain um, certain materials, and how do they relate to these personal and collective um, histories? Yeah, of course. I think that I feel like materials to me are the words that that I use in um, in my own work. And I feel I use, I think materials, they're kind of like they themselves are inherently imbued with so much politics or there's so much history. And I think I think that the materials have witnessed history. And, you, you know, you're talking before about that archive. And I think especially with my history, there is no archive. There is nothing, there is very, you know, we don't have museums or we don't have kind of visual or artifacts or things that we can see or or experience. They're all in the oral history or there. I always feel like our history has been absorbed into the earth and and the land and, you know, and the way that that we hear from from our ancestors. But I think that like materials, I think I go back to them because because they themselves seem to capture so much without trying to find the words. Um, and the way that I imagine materials is if I close my eyes and I think of the imprint or the impression that they they leave. And just as an example, some materials I use um, a, a gold. I use a lot of gold in my work, and for me, that kind of it always it's always signified the dalit body to me it's kind of it's compressed it's it's resilient it's it's dictated by this kind of arbitrary value system it's but there's just so much lusciousness and and so much integrity in in gold and and the way that it's used for adornment i use sindoor which is like a really blood red kind of pigment that's used by women um, and also in a lot of religious materials, I use a lot of pigments and and kind of festival. A lot of um, materials come from that kind of like Hindu rituals, which I grew up with um, because my my we grew up with Hinduism. But whereas my father's consciousness kind of um, anti caste consciousness grew, all of those idols were 
taken away, that kind of shrine that we had in our home was taken away. But I still return back to that because I think those materials like cotton wicks, um, that language and that material and that ritual of material comes into that work. And I guess I, I don't know how to describe it because they just make sense to me because they capture they capture everything I'm trying to say, which is of this moment of caste, but also kind of captures how ancient it is. And the building up these surfaces is such a quiet meditation on it. Um, so I think I think materials they just they have a, a way of capturing that history. And um, I use cow dung, and I know that that's the that's the thing that we kind of um, sort of first worked over is is thinking about cow, cow dung because it's it's very sacred, but it's also part of these stories and this literature that I that I read it was used to clean homes and um and and fuel you know fuel fires for rituals so I think I find these materials have been witnesses throughout history and I bring them into my studio and and they kind of take center stage and I'm not sure why I do it but I guess one of the reasons is that fragmentation I was saying before it's trying to understand this this enormous um, legacy and the only way to do so is just to just to go with the immediacy of what makes sense in in one's hand and that's what materials do they bring me back back to what makes sense in this in this moment you know, as opposed to trying to create an idea of what cast my cast history looks like it just comes right back to what to these materials and their their voice in a way yeah yeah um and i know i know that cow dung is kind of you know you've especially your your thesis and your research has been around cow dung so i'd love you know what i'd love your thoughts on on that as a material as well yeah i think um i mean for me whenever you've spoken about materials they sort of embody your whole practice and i think once you mentioned uh the, I mean, obviously, the materials have a textural quality to them, but you also call them textures of, in terms of like feelings. And I found that really uh, a very nice description. I think you said textures of stigma, textures of shame, textures of of sex and all of these things um, kind of coming together. But like you said, cow dung was the reason that we first connected. And um, I, I remember this incident that you told me about your, the sourcing of your cow dung which I thought um, kind of, uh, it, it really says the, that, that story is kind of the, um, it really talks about what you do with the material. So just to summarize the story for everyone here, um, Kirtika wanted cow dung uh, for one of her works, or several of her works, and she um, sourced it from a Hindu religious center in Australia. And they told her that the cow dung was the the purpose of the cow dung was to be used in an agni hotra, which is a purification ritual by upper castes, and so in taking that cow dung into her studio, which was kind of her safe space, she subverted um uh the 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 religious and ritualistic association of cow dung and kind of reclaimed it as her own and made it what she thinks in terms of textures or or any other meaning that she was able to assign to it. Um, and this again connects to the personal and the collective in terms of your body um, shaping the materials into the art art form, and so the the actual art practice itself, um, the connection of your body to these materials. So, like the way your hand uh, shapes the cow dung, or the sindur, or the gold. Um, I think. You know that uh, you once mentioned again to me, and I'm sorry to keep referring to what you said once before, but you said that it's kind of in your blood, and you kind of automatically know what to do with these materials. It's like a subconscious um, uh, inheritance of transmuting trauma, I think you called it, um, because then you're it's it's interesting because you're using the materials to transmute this trauma, to to reclaim it, to give it, assign it your own meaning. And then there's also this personal and collective history and the sensorial memory. And then there's also the aesthetic of the material itself. Like, how does it look? Uh, what uh, Even if you don't know its context, it, it has a certain aesthetic value in terms of its color, in terms of, um, I mean, I think once you, you 
you you shape the cow dung etc it kind of loses its smell but um still mm. all of uh, all of the the sensory things not just as me memory but also as actual visual aesthetic um so you know it's a connection to your body to the earth to the land think all these themes that you're quite uh, interested in exploring in your work so maybe this is a good time to kind of go into into that and what does your body and the material mean in relation yeah. to one another yeah it's 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 always interesting to hear you kind of talk about them because i feel like um i feel like in the studio there's just such a silence that and and this is what i really enjoy about making is that I think when we do talk about these things, there's it's just such a loaded history, and I can't emphasize that enough. And even the body, I feel like the body of an Indian woman and a Dalit woman, you know, like I feel like that history, everything about our body is so defined and constricted, you know, the way we who we talk to, who we interact with, and and that continues in the diaspora, you know. Uh, it's like all of that, all of that conditions on all of those things are still so hold our body and I think that um the experience I find in making the work and in being in the studio is it just slips away and there's just this um it just is you know it's just there's no there's no need to negotiate that space and I think that's actually quite powerful and I think that that to me is what is what my history is you know not not what people say or not what the way that people I I just think that that experience of being able to create or just that pure act of creation is just is um is so powerful and once again I feel like I'm putting words to this and I don't even know if they're kind of accurate enough to describe that but I guess what I'm trying to say is that everything fails in that space and and what I experience in that space is it's just you know just decision making and it's just it's like the body that is not um that is that has not been told what to do no one told me how to make art like this and no one told me I mean I went to art school I did training but ultimately it is the un, it is the unlearning and the undoing of of what I have been told to the ways I've been told to um, internalize, you know, the patriarchal and caste things that I've observed with my eyes. Um, and I think that earth and the land is so powerful. I, I started this talk with, with an acknowledgement um, of country. And I, I just, I feel that so strongly. And, and I say this as someone who is not, you know, who has not grown up on in, in, in Dili where I was born, but I, I just feel like our history our, has been captured in that land because there is such I always think where is where is our history written? It it has to have been witnessed somewhere. And I feel like that is that is the land and that is the earth that comes in. And I find, I don't just say that, I find when I'm making, there is just a constant reflection on on the earth and on and there is this sense of the ancestral in the earth. And that's where I think, you know, our, our Dalit history is ancient and but it's not catalogued, it's not archived. And I, I reflect on that. And I, I think I get the sense of the ancient through the body and through through the making. And that is that kind of access point that is that is undefined. And and I always feel strange talking about it because I feel like I'm defining something that that is just so free. And and that that sense of free is so foreign to the the body that I have been born into as a you know as a woman in India of of Dalit um yeah of a Dalit background yeah um, I think I, I mean I I can keep talking to you about your materials and your uh, but let's uh, <laughs> okay. let's connect that to the to the work now um, okay. I think this might make it might make sense and so um for everyone here we're planning to talk about two two of the works that she's done which were part of um uh, an exhibition called stone idols which was in sydney um yeah. and uh so i'm going to share my screen and then we'll we'll speak about it so that you know can everyone see yes yeah, Lisa, we can. Okay, so this was her work, which I introduced in the beginning, but we're going to talk about this one first. 
Um, so Ketika, I know that this was inspired by Bebitai Kamble's text, The Prisons We Broke, or Jin Amutsa, which is the title of your of your piece. Um, so can you talk a little bit about um, what what is it in words, uh, like or maybe specifically Bebitai Kamble's word, words that inspired you to make to make this and how did you come up with the idea for this piece and you know just a little bit about your process for this yeah of course I think I think the reason why perhaps it's so easy to make work from words is that the the literature itself the literature is truly monumental it just lends itself but it's it's not sentimental it's just raw it's it can be translated and when I read it it's so visceral that I can imagine I want to capture that literary landscape and put it into a material one. And I think that's what happened with this work. I created this over the, the lockdown and I was living with my mother at that time. Um, and I was so blown away by Babita Gumble's book, The Prisons We Broke. And the title of this um, is, is the, the, the true title. The, and The Prisons We Broke is the translated title. Incredible book that I, 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 don't even, I don't have the words to describe, but... It is just a raw and uncompromising um, voice of one of the first Dalit women who wrote her life story and her incredible legacy. Um, and I was reading this and I, I didn't know how to process it other than put and compile and collect and compress these materials. And um, Anisha, I know that you've written a lot about this and I feel that my words <laughs> kind of pale in comparison to yours, but... I think that's where the work came from was a, an attempt to to capture this incredible monumental text and it surprises me that that these books are not um are not discussed and and uh perhaps maybe perhaps in in, in the circles that I am in but I'm they, these truly are incredible books and I think it was a just a way to process that because they have such an enormous impact yeah, um, I think, uh, yes, this is one of the works that I'm writing about uh, for my thesis, and I have looked at it many times over the last years, and every every time I've see, uh, looked at it, I've, I've thought, I've come up with a new new idea and new interpretation, but um, I, I, I was particularly intrigued by the fact that, you know, you made it in the presence of your mother and uh, what that meant, and um, that kind of reflects the personal histories that we were talking about earlier. Um, but just to, just to give everyone here an idea of, say, how I go about interpreting this work based on, I've had, I've interviewed Kirtika, I've listened to her analysis of the work. So um, I thought I would just break it down into, in, into parts. Um, so from a purely visual perspective first, uh, we see a predominantly black surface um, with a lot of texture. It's streaked with specks of gold and red. Um, and the gold, to me at least, particularly stands out because I guess that's the nature of gold as a material. Um, another interesting thing is that the black is not a uniform shade of black. It's uh, varying shades of black, um, kind of like a geological rock surface, which again, reflects Kirtika's interest in the land and the earth. And um, I think you even compared this one to the Sydney coast, uh, which, which, is, which is fascinating. Um, and in such a large work, because it's eight panels and each panel is 110 by 100 centimeters, um, it, it seems impossible that you have achieved this balance of so many, so many materials that you've used but you've done it, and I find that really um, inspiring. I mean, if I was an artist, I would. I hope that I would create work like this. Um, and the the gold, which I spoke about, which stood out to me, I think you compared it to the Dalit body shining like embers on a black surface, um, which again is uh, is a very uh, evocative uh, kind of way of describing it. So now that we've looked at it purely from a visual perspective. I knew that you were inspired by Baby Tai Kamble's book. So I read her book, uh, which I recommend everyone here reads if they if they ever get a chance. Um, it's So this is a direct inspiration of literature into art. Um, and 
so how I was trying, I really was reflecting on how do I see these words reflected in this pure visual form. And there are many compositional elements that reflect the book, but I think what really um, struck me, and maybe that's because I'm I'm writing on the representation of the cow, and I was particularly interested in your use of cow dung, but there was this description in, in the book of a buffalo sacrifice, um, and it was a very um, raw description of like a bull's head being severed, um, and you know, it rolled to one side with blood, flowing profusely from its body and uh, the bull's eyes were um, open in in its death and it was a very haunting uh, sort of image and so I for some reason I kept going back to that passage and I kept seeing that here like I know that that spoke a lot about blood and you would think of maybe that this whole work would be red if it was reflecting that but you know the red streaks that you have um, it kind of is at least to me, uh, it kind of spoke about this sacrifice and, um, you know, you paying attention to the the bull because it's a predominantly black surface. Somehow that was the description that most stayed with me in relation uh, to this work. And I, I we've, we've discussed this particular instance from the book before. Um, and lastly, you know, uh, obviously this is a, personal and collective history because collective because it's Kamble's words that are coming out in your visual re rendition and also personal because you made it in the presence of your mother and um, which is sort of like its own collaboration so um, yeah that would be my my take on on this work um, since we were just since I just mentioned both baby Tai Kamble and your mother um, they're both Dalit women who have inspired you and I know that uh, you are you are often inspired by women particularly and so maybe we could talk a little because the next work is about women so these are some details of of this one and you can see the textures and and the the different materials at play um, but the womb of a jikol is about women and so maybe we could talk a little bit about your inspiration um, from women. And also this is a Manusmriti text. So I'll, I, I, I won't give anything away. You describe it first in your own words and then I will again analyze it. Yeah, of course. Um, just on the point of women, I think that, um, I think you're right. I, I reflect on that a lot because I think, I mean, I grew up watching the labor of both my parents, but also like the kind of silent labor of my mother to, and, you know, the way she kind of negotiated the move to Australia and just, and also the stories that I think, I think a lot about the pa patriarchal structures that are kind of sewn in, not just it, within caste structures, but also within Indian society. And I think I reflect a lot of that, but I also think about what, what a Dalit woman is. And I think once again, in the literature I've read, um, there are a few books I actually have next to me um, Urmila Pavar's The Weave of My Life I've been reading We Also Made History by once again Urmila Pavar, Minakshi Moon and Spotted Goddesses which is um, uh, by Roja Singh who actually went to went and kind of has described the resilience and the importance of Dalit women in seeing Dr Ambedkar's vision in the way that they not only keep their family, but their community, they're, they're kind of the rock. And I, I reflect on that. I'm reflecting a lot of that in my work at the moment because I, I'm, I think that the the canvases I'm I'm doing, and we'll discuss this later, is is just is connected so much to that maternal and ancestral. And I think a lot about the the continuation and the legacy and the kind of the silent labor of the, the Dalit woman. Um, and um, and also, also my, my, obviously myself, like the, I think the way that that's kind of embodied and inherited to a point where you kind of look at those inherited um, things and, you know, the, once again, that connection to body and all of understanding that within myself. Um, and 
Um, and this work, um, this work was made, this work was made uh, based on the Manusmiti, which I, once again, I've no words to describe how, um, how kind of earth shattering that is to read these deeply problematic, insulting, degrading texts that clearly demarcate what Shudra, what women, you know, and their role in society. And there's no other way to process that sometimes other than just to put that into the process, into the work. And this was printed, this was, I, I do a lot of, I, I trained as a printmaker, so I do a lot of screen printing. And instead of using the screen print as the medium to print with, I've printed, that is the work itself. So this is a disused silk screen. And I always find that interesting because the object, the silk screen itself has had been printed and has been used so much um, that it has its own history when I work with it. And this text on this is, is an excerpt from the Manusmithi. Um, and I've printed it with Sindur. So it, when we look later on it, if you, if you look up close, it's kind of that pigment is sort of bursting through the screen. And it's an excerpt. Um, and I didn't, I, I, I don't logically think about these works. It's just, I think, a way of physically printing with and processing the violence of these texts and these words um, on the body. Yeah, I think um, I was also very interested in the fact that you it, it's a disused silk, silk screen um, because the screen printing pro process and the spontaneity that comes with the process, you have to be so quick, um, quick in, um, in it. And like, I guess you can make mistakes and the mistakes become a part of the work. And I remember you saying some of the smudges or like the text being slightly off center um, was part like it wasn't planned and I think that that's the beauty of 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 something like a screen print um and you know I I think I tied this uh, when I was looking at it you sent me the Manusmriti uh, verse uh, that that led you to to do this work and um you know uh, I I'm not going to quote the verse here but I think it was verse five or something like that if anyone wants to wants to look it up but uh I was you know I was fascinated because it's a disused silk, silk screen um the uh the slit on the right side of the work which was part of 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 it it kind of adds a, a really interesting visual element to the to to the whole idea that you're trying to convey because the slit seems to resonate with the violence and that was what um, you know the violence of the text ma made you feel inspired to make this work and the color red obviously stands out in this as compared to the previous one which was predominantly black um, so you know overall this the it also resembles an illuminated manuscript if you know what I mean and I think even in your gallery like the way it was displayed in the gallery there was a spotlight on it making it look and that's interesting because while the Manusmriti is a very revered text in India even today, um, then you're, it's kind of displayed in that sense, but then you're also subverting its very meaning and essence. So, um, yeah, I think uh, that I, I didn't want to go too much in detail, but that was what that was how I, I was looking at this particular work. Um, yeah. The, Sorry, Anita, I, yeah. I just remembered when I, um, it's a bit hard to tell on the screen, but it was, that the yellow part was actually like gold pigment so when the when it was in the gallery it did what you're saying it did, it did remind me that it did kind of illuminate a bit in, in that way in that space yeah maybe you know yeah you can see a little yeah. bit more in detail here I think mm -hmm. um I, so I did say that you know you subvert the meaning and you know I'm using these big big terms um to just use another big like a lot of when a lot of the writing on on Dalit art talks about resistance and reclamation and, you know, they're, they're heavy words. And we've spoken a lot about what these words mean and are you comfortable uh, using those words to describe your work? And I thought maybe you could talk a little bit about about the weight of words in general and maybe particularly some words that kind of run through um descriptions of works like this 
Yeah, of course. I think, and maybe what I, I think part of being in the diaspora is that I, I never want to represent my community because I don't, I, I have a very particular experience and a very nuanced experience of what, and as I said, this kind of trying to, you know, understand pieces of what I've, what I've been given and what I do, I, is a way of understanding that. And, and, and that's why I think that this space, um, within arts, within, and, you know, many of the other, other speakers in Open Borders, there's people who do such incredible work and I have a great deal of respect for them. And I guess when I think of, you know, words like, you know, resistance, or I, I think it, it's more that I'm, I'm trying to stay away from the idea of that and just to work on unravelling, you know, very personally just what I understand to be my own uh truth and honest experience of what it is and not kind of over pronouncing that but just kind of expressing just my own investigation for example um you know some of the works that have informed my my you know my body's the body of work that I've I've made in the past one you know one of the questions would be like what where is that inherited wound within my own body or you know another question that sort of infer, informed a, a work was if what would it like with Babur al Bagul's work when when I hid my cast in, incredible book that is so visceral and raw I wanted to imagine objects if they were to fall out of that book so it's kind of an extension of my own imagination and just staying with that because I think that I don't want to claim to be doing anything you know I'm I'm finding my own uh, connection and and my own connection to my community um and I think that just staying with that is is what I at the moment what feels uh honest for me and I think that that's kind of um yeah I, I think it as I said before a lot of it's such a it's such a opinionated kind of loud space you know and we, we see that a lot um and I think just returning back to what has always been and, and what has always been you know true and and just trying to understand that just one step in in front of my own experience it first is what makes sense at this moment yeah um can you so in relation to that um because you know informing a community or like you know uh, representing specific things can you talk a little bit about the work in terms of its reception because you're displaying this in australia um, and so I'm interested to know what the, the context of caste is there and how, how it's received there versus anywhere else that you might have displayed and are there differences that you see and do you find yourself having to explain a lot? Um, I know you recently did a show as well, um, so maybe you could talk a little bit about those differences. Yeah, it's it's so interesting because I think sometimes in the art through art it's it's an it's a a very grateful to have that opportunity to to talk or to create this space that you know to to place this work or to have it exist and then sometimes it's kind of a, become a bit and we were talking about this the other day becoming a bit disillusioned in you know and I think sometimes it feels a bit like the art world is you know it kind of celebrates these narratives or it's always looking for the next narrative and I think sometimes that's a bit disheartening and then it's also like this kind of strange hierarchical system in itself and and sometimes putting work out there is a way of existing in but not becoming that hierarchy it's it's I'm not sure how to describe it yet but I'm still learning and ex you know trying to exist in it and, and stay true to the work and I and I always I always feel like the the place where I, I don't have to once again negotiate that is just in the making of it and that's always feels like I always feel like nobody has um any say or any power in that space except the the work and that's kind of really really uh, amazing to witness um, and you're right. I, I think a lot of that there, there is a lot, a lot of Dalit. There is a strong Dalit community in Sydney, but like myself, we we never grew up. We don't go to you know. It, I think growing up, art wasn't part of our. 
our lives and I still see that so often when I show the work I do have to talk to an audience who who don't are who aren't acquainted with cast and somehow I actually feel that's changing because I did a a recent exhibition in Melbourne, um, which was curated by Vishal Kumar Swami. And he, um, and it was the first time there was an acknowledgement of my community in, in that exhibition. And I was just so blown away because I know that my, my parents and I would, you know, would never imagine that that space would actually exist in Australia. And also a recent exhibition, um, I did in Berlin, which was called Wake Up Call for My Ancestors. It's probably two exhibitions where it's like, finally, we don't have to explain and begin, you know, and kind of, I mean, yes, provide context for, but having to once again validate your own experience and then trying to dredge up, you know, the facts and figures of why these things matter. It's it's a, it's a bit... Um, it's a bit exhausting, but I think that I think it's changing, and I think it's changing for the better. I'm, I'm, I feel optimistic about this. There's still a lot of work to do, but uh, yeah, I mean, audience reception is always, and I've discussed this with a lot of friends who make a lot of voices, a lot of people from different communities who are putting their art out there, and and sometimes feel that there's integrity in that, sometimes don't, and there is no neat answer, but it's it's a constant to and fro and the only time I don't feel that is when I'm actually making the work yeah yeah I remember when I first saw your works in person um in London last year um and before that I'd only seen them online and so it was very actually here um just this a picture of us together uh at her <laughs> exhibition last year um and it was uh it was it was not even in a gallery space really it was in a office um of, mm. of Sonam Kapoor's husband um but anyway <laughs> uh, so it it was very uh different for me to to experience the works in person because um I knew the context but uh you know the textures and the I I actually felt like touching everything which probably was inappropriate in that setting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah but I I did because they're so texture textural and material oriented and I I also remember like it was very interesting for me to hear uh I was kind of eavesdropping I guess on what other the other people in the room were were saying and whether they understood the context and I feel like a lot of them did not even though a lot of them work from South Asia in in general but um so it was it was very um and you of course gave an introduction so it did kind of uh set the tone but at the same time I I was it was always it was uh it was curious to see how like were people looking at the work just uh, from a purely aesthetic perspective or were they looking at it for its context or were they able to kind of marry both together um yeah uh so you know i i so oh, oh, through through the stock and obviously we finally met i feel like we've kind of built a collaboration um in terms of artist and aspiring art historian and I, I think the the why we did this talk as well was to highlight what can come out of a conversation and a collaboration between two people who are working on on similar things but from like have very different approaches because mine is more uh, the written word and you while you do write your art practice is um, of course your primary focus. Um, but and I've also obviously uh, spoken to other artists um, who are your friends, your co colleagues, and so maybe you could reflect a little bit on um, on those shows that you just mentioned um, in terms of your collaboration, not just with other people who write about art like me, but in in the artist community, like Sajan Mani, uh, Rajshri Goody. Um, we, I, I mean, I had the honor of writing for you and Sajan uh, last year as well um, in this show, Earth 200 CE, which was uh, in Sydney again. And Sajan couldn't be there at the show, but uh, the 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 two TV screens are Sajan's um, work for everyone watching. Um, so yeah, maybe you could talk a little bit about this show and the other show, and you know, just your collaboration your ideas on collaboration in general yeah I think um I find them so exciting because I love discussing with other artists um 
Sajan is is based in Berlin and he was probably the first person who I could actually talk with and go, how are you finding this system? What about showing this work? And I'm so I think that's what I'm so excited about at the moment. And also recently with Vishal in, in Melbourne, incredible exhibition Okuta, which is the, the idea of a gathering or an assembly. And he brought Melbourne Bay to start us, some Indian, um, some Dalit artists from India and just this amazing pot of like just and really foregrounded in the exhibition the importance of institutional care you know the institution being accountable and responsible for providing care and this kind of environment for its artists and I've felt walking into that space how different it was as I said to you it was the first time that I didn't have to explain cast and when they because it was a Melbourne audience they did um they did you know provide context to the audience there was an acknowledgement of country and then but it was started with a trigger warning you know it was before the description of cast happened and I just thought that you know there's small things like that which show that we for the people in this room we understand what you have experienced first you know first and second generation and I think just that sensitivity is it just goes so far and I, I really hope to see that more in our circles is understanding that you know sometimes you can't just say things or you you have to provide a, a safe space when talking about this and we discussed this um, earlier, Nisha, as well, in, in kind of academia as well, extending that into institutions and in universities. Um, but, yeah, I think the Wake Up Call for My Ancestors was a, a really interesting project in Berlin that happened late um, late last year in Berlin. And Sajan uh, very generously invited three artists, including himself, uh, so four artists, including himself, and then three academics. And he hosted a panel where we discussed archives and and the importance of our history and in this kind of you know panel where the academics sort of took took center stage and really discussed and opened up that debate and then it was an exhibition and I think for that first time seeing art and academia come together because I think sometimes when you're just in the art world you kind of just see the you know the networking the sort of drudgery or the the kind of eliteness of it and then and I'm, I'm not sure what it's like in academia but I remember you know where you were sort of saying how I think but though when they come together and when they when you can see uh, both aspects of them working together, I thought um, I thought that was a very effective collaboration. And also just meeting the academics, you know, Sanal Mohan, Gajendran, um, Ayudhar, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm probably saying his last name incorrectly, but amazing, courageous, vivacious people. And I don't meet that in the art world. And I was just like, I I was so moved to meet fellows in academia who are addressing the same thing but just from a different perspective and I hope to see more of those collaborations. Yeah same um, I, I remember seeing uh, unfortunately I couldn't see that in person again but uh, the Instagram for wake up call for my ancestors was quite active and um, it was a very um, yeah very powerful like coming together and I think Sajan is, is very good at at doing that, you know, like navigating that space and bringing bringing uh, all of these different perspectives together. Um, yeah, I'm Good. actually. Um, I, I'm sorry. I have to. I'm, I was really interested because I know that we've talked a lot about your. Um, I guess the way that you've navigated this field and your research, right? And I, I thought I would. Um, I'd also ask, like, how have you kind of like what have the challenges been for you in this field? And then also like how, I mean, what would you like to see in the future of where it goes? What is what has been your experience? Because you you are writing about things that you, I, I don't imagine many PhD, um, you know, students have, are writing about. So how, how what has your experience been? Um, I think it's it's been it's been both challenging and rewarding as cliche as that sounds the challenges are definitely so it's working with with artists who are developing their practice like you um it like I said in the beginning I have to be sensitive and listen and you know really acknowledge your lived experiences but then there's also the question of accessibility and how I mean everyone is busy and when there's 
there's not so much scholarship on these practices. I have to rely on these interviews and um, speaking to the artist directly. All because even like show reviews in newspapers and stuff are very um, small. They're not. They're not huge. And so the challenge has been actually kind of gathering all of this scholarship and and um, then uh, you know acknowledging acknowledging the the sensitive nature of all of this plus but also trying to be critical and you know you like you've become my friend so how do I become how it's hard for me to to criticize your work in that sense so those those are some of the some of the challenges that I I'm constantly thinking about especially as I'm writing now because you know it's towards the end and I'm trying to pull everything together um but yeah, I think I would like to see uh, more scholarship on art and caste. It is slowly growing um, and that's that's good. And so I, I hope that over the next many years, we see a lot more. And I'd also like to see um, a kind of, there's not that much scholarship on South Asian art and animals, um, even though animals are very, uh, very significant. And there's there's a lot on animals, but it's just not, very much there's not that much from an art historical perspective so uh, I found it hard to to find scholarship that brings caste and animals together um, so those have been some some of my challenges but um, you know I, I I've still learned so much and I, I feel like the the thing that I've realized over the past four years is the the strength of art as a pedagogical tool in terms of like just teaching um, people and I mean obviously it's not your role to teach anyone anything but your art does it automatically and I think that's the beauty of it um yeah so I don't know if that answers your question but yeah, no it's it's a lot and you know it's been incredible to to hear your interpretation or the way that you think and the way you put words to a lot of these things which I I'm not sure even the artists are kind of considering so it's it's been a really interesting way to to work you, you know with you and also to see you and get to know you and, and see your research develop over the years as well and I look forward to to seeing the conclusion in the way that you resolve these and and hopefully seeing more research like yourself thank you Anisha yeah no thank you and um do you want to just I have these, this is the last slide of just the, oh, what you're currently is... working on. So do you want to talk a little bit about yeah, you were saying that you're, you're currently using a lot of color and so maybe you can reflect a little bit on that before we. End. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm actually sitting in my studio. So the works <laughs> are right in front of me. So they're very fresh. Um, and I think, um, non, I, I guess it's a natural ev evolution, the works. And at the moment, the the kind of evolution of my thought is, I've just been thinking about the vibrancy of our community, of our history, of our, um, you know, I think when 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 the Dalit body is discussed, it's always, it's the, the victim or the oppressed. It's the, and and it's, it's so important to bring, to bring awareness to that. But then there's also, I think sometimes that comes to the cost of how the, celebrating our joy, our, you know, our, our, our sadness, our, our passion, our there's just so much nuance. And once again, I'm not sure if I find the words for it, but I think that just the colour and the vibrancy of the works um, are an interrogation. And also considering the healing, I've been reflecting a lot. Um, uh, my, my father actually passed away four years ago and I've been thinking a lot about the healing of his life, you know, that what comes after that rage, what comes, how do you, how do you find rest in that? Um, thinking about you know my my mother's uh, illness as well, which is once again seeing the force of the the that inheritance, seeing the kind of seeing that in my parents, and I've been reflecting a lot on healing. Um, and I think I think strangely the I guess the color is coming out of that reflection. And once again, I don't sit in my studio and decide on these colors; they're just a way. They're a natural uh, expression of a question, and the question is just um, where you know what. What about this celebration? What about the joy? What about our carnival? What about our? There is so much nuance to what our lives are, and 
And I think it's just a reflection on that. And you'll see more of that. And I and I hope to share more works. And I hope to see more works from my my you know fellow from from um, that it's all around the world as we celebrate um, that inheritance that we have as we as we heal and as we um, and, and as we show and share this work. Thank you. Um, I think that's a good good place for us to um, stop the conversation that yeah. we're having, but we're happy to to open it up and take if there are any questions or thoughts. Um, yeah. Thank you. Sorry, Nicole. No, you can start, Marina, while I'm struggling with technology, as always. <laughs> no, I, I just wanted to say this was so deep and powerful. I am amazed. I think I will listen to this conversation in the recording many more times. Um, this is a space and time to ask questions. I think Judith would like to ask the first one. And everyone else, you're welcome to put your questions in chat or raise your virtual hand and then yes it's, it's just um you know reaction question uh so thank you so much that was absolutely wonderful um and you know there is i mean something um i mean robin cohen was saying that there is something called the magic of creolization um i would say that there is a you know the magic of conversation i mean you have those two separate ways of you know thinking i mean very different um world views as well but in a conversation you just grow together and what emerges out of the conversation is something again new you know and completely different so the the conversation in itself was wonderful uh between the two of you and i actually have a have a, a proposal as well for you i'll, I'll let you know afterwards um, but I would like to go back to what you were saying at the beginning, uh, when you acknowledged the country you live in. Um, I was wondering whether, you know, what kind of um, contact or interaction did you have with uh, Aborigines in, um, in Australia? And whether that interaction or that work or that conversation, you know, with Aborigines in Australia had also brought you back in a kind of, you know, detour, had brought you back as well to India and to Adivasis. And how would that, you know, work for you? Yeah, um, I think, I guess, Judith, the, um, growing up in Sydney, you know, I, I, I our education and understanding the history of First Nations peoples in Australia is very important. And also there is quite a, there is also, um, it's important to have those connections and conversations that come from a very rooted understanding of one's community. And I guess I haven't been able to, to have that. I, I reflect a lot on my education and reading and understanding of First Nations and bring that but I think I think in Australia I guess First Nations history has a understandably so a great deal of sensitivity around it and I think those conversations and those collaborations are quite slow and and I and I, I hope and I'm, I'm sure in the future there there will be more of that but I think at this moment um I've reflected more than I have actively sought to mm. connect with um, with First Nations communities in Australia. Mm. And once again, because I think that, you know, often we talk about caste and we we link it to race or we think of it, you know, about through indigeneity. And I think sometimes, sometimes the whether you're on the receiving or the on on the, you know, if you're initiating that or if you're on the receiving end, there is a kind of thing of it has to be rooted in a lot of respect because there is a lot of difference as well as similarities. And I think understanding that is important. Um, I don't know if I've answered the question, but I think that that's a growing um, area. And I, and I think that will naturally happen as my mm -hmm. own connection to my community, as well as um, 
my deepening because also as I said I've grown up in Sydney and and we learn and we we read and we we educate ourselves about First Nations but actually connecting to and being more conversing with that First Nations history is, is actually something that I don't think many Australian people who grow up in Australia have. Exactly yeah. but you know but I needed to ask that question I mean I'm, I'm yeah. not surprised at the response yeah. But I needed to ask the uh, the question in the, in many ways, and also the the proposal I wanted to um, uh, to make briefly. We can you know come back to it uh, later. Is for you? I mean, an invitation for you to uh, think about another conversation that you would like to have with another you know artist or another critic, and that we can host. You know, so we can talk about that um, later. But. Gigi is always plotting <laughs> a plot of own nature. <laughs> but so I just wanted to kind of second what Gigi said so about the uh, the beauty of this conversation. It was just so wonderful listening to you, and I, I was just completely riveted. And I felt like it, it, you could have gone on and on and on, and I would have been just happy to sit here and listen. Um, and Marina has kind of discreetly asked me, "Shall I? Do you want to ask the next question?" But I have loads of little questions, so I think I'll let Marina and others go first. First, because I think my, my questions are literally at the moment all over the place. I've got loads of notes. But Marina, if you want to go ahead in case you have a, um, another fully fledged question. Oh, hi, Hugo. Nice to see Hugo. you. It's ages <laughs> since I met you. It's so good to see you. <laughs> Do you have a question? Oh, yes, you have your hand up. Excellent. So I don't know, you know, Marina and Hugo, and uh, whoever wants to go first. I mean, if you're, you've mentioned it already, I'll start it if I may. I hope it won't be too uh, long. Uh, my question or yeah, re reflection is about the materials you use, Kirtika. Um, what I've been thinking about a lot because I work with that literature text, of course, and I've been thinking a lot about the aesthetic of disgust, what some mm -hmm. people have called the Bibhatsarasa and how Dalit writers have been using this aesthetic of disgust in their works and I personally see kind of um in evolution in the in 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 how it has been used like in the very beginning Marathi Dalit writers like uh, okay I don't remember names at the moment um have been have been using the revolting of disgust to just show the dirt and smell and you know of busties maybe and then i've seen in dalit writing that it has kind of evolved and the, uh, the author i'm thinking about right now is tulsiram who uses in my opinion i think the way he uses it in his text is kind of close to to what we've seen on the first work that, that you've been talking about because in his when he describes a place where they would skin a dead animal and the blood and the dirt and the um, sweat and all of that, it looks to me like a piece of art. I think it, it looks really beautiful. So what I thought about is like that he was subverting the revolting and making it into something beautiful. And, and what you are doing is kind of, the next step is is like it's a picture you can look at it and, and if you don't have a context if you don't really know what this is about you can just look at it and think wow this is so beautiful and what i found so interesting and in what when you spoke about uh, materials was that when you spoke about cow dung you didn't even mention any negative uh reactions pe people might have you said it's been used to clean houses Right, it's also been used to um, the, on roofs, I think. So I, I wanted to ask you whether whether you do this consciously, the the subverting, and whether you use other materials that could be like right the hair, right? You mentioned here. Do you also use blood or vermilion? Looks a lot like blood, right? The the womb of a jackal really looks bloody. Uh, seriously bloody picture I thought so I wanted to ask yeah about that if you could say yeah I, I think um I'm not sure if it's 
if it's so conscious. But as, as I said, when I think of the materials, like, you know, I think of like if you close your eyes and you just remember the impression or, of lines and often like, you know, if you look at rope, that kind of the edge of that rope, the you know, the the sort of I think the textures and the skins of these materials, I think there's something it's not conscious, it's not a way to evoke anything. I think it's just a natural way to think through and imagine and and sense and feel through this visual language. And um, and and it's interesting, I think I've talked a lot about materials, but I think also process is so important in this because the way that I create the works is I layer the materials, they dry, I put another, you know, I take off, I remove. It's like this... Um, once again, it's this kind of working to and fro and there is, and I spend a lot of time cleaning my studio because there's such violent, you know, like this, there's such cathartic material to have things sprayed everywhere. And there's just, there's something about this ecosystem and about the actual process of building this up, which is so, it's beautiful, but in this kind of very, very grotesque way. And, and there's, I, I cannot even begin to compare to this, this, um, you know, to the lived reality and and these these texts and and I, and that's never the intention to do so. I think it's it's just a quite reflection on and like for example, um, you know, my mother would describe when when she was a young, like part of her home was made from mud from and I think I think it's those kind of well, I don't have a visual mem I don't have a visual way to understand what her home looked like, but it's kind of the imaginative and. And I think the grotesque and the beautiful is so such an interesting tension in art. And I do bring a lot of materials that relate to la labor, religion, and these, you know, these kind of, I bring them all into the studio. Sometimes they're really lustrous, really. I use a lot of tar, which is very heavy. And, but it's the way of thinking of its coagulation, the way there's some part of the body in, in these materials you know, the way that they form the skins, the way they crumble, it, you know, and you can see it on the surface of a city, the skins of cities. And I, I think a lot about that in, and that com comes through naturally in the work. Yeah. And can I just mm -hmm. add to that and say that I think, um, I don't know if, if an audience member described uh, Gina Mucha like intestines, you once told me that someone said, uh, or was that your own description? And I I actually have a, a small section of my thesis, Kitika's chapter, writing about the aesthetic of disgust and in terms of cow dung and this whole idea of like the insides of a body and what does that mean? And cow dung as a material, which is actually um, like an ex excretion really and like what that means in terms of touching. So, yeah. Yeah. And it's so interesting because I actually don't think of disgust, you know, I, 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 and I understand what you're saying, but I don't, I actually think the opposite. I think how profoundly beautiful and sometimes that's what I read in, into the literature. And I understand that they're not trying to talk about or glorify or romanticize that. But sometimes I think that there is this kind of, there's almost like two sides of the same coin. And sometimes they sort of flip, you know, that, the disgust and beauty of, I, I don't know, maybe just no, no, a reflection. Yeah. What I said about Tulsiram's work, it's exactly what, what you said, but okay, enough with me. Hugo, would you like to go? <laughs> Great, Thank, thanks very much. Thanks Anisha and Ketika for a wonderful conversation, really thought provoking and, and, and um, thanks Judith, Nicole and Marina for organizing this. I had hundreds of questions, but I'll confine myself to just a couple. The first one is that you, you talk about being inspired by Baby Camblay's the, the, the prisons we, we broke, but you, you seek to capture that in, in fairly abstract forms. And I wondered what was your thinking there? And did you consider using more figurative art or was that the intention always to make people think and to engage in, in practices of interpretation? So, so if you could reflect on that a little bit, uh, a, a sort of related question there for Anisha is, you spoke of eavesdropping on people as, as they looked around. Did, did you get a sense of how people were engaging with the art and, and interpreting it? Um, another 
question is about the audience again. And I remember being in South India at Dalit Art Festival um, where it was mostly music, but they had a small exhibition where, quotes ordinary Dalits, so people off the street could rock up and engage with, with these powerful works. Have you ever had the opportunity to display your work to sort of ordinary members of the Dalit community and, and what sort of engagement and response have you had, if so? And then the final question, in terms of cast experience, you, you spoke about some experiences when you were younger, but I wondered whether you'd have any since exhibiting your work. And I'm thinking of Meena Kandasamy, who I've done some work with, and, and she's experienced a whole lot of abuse online and, and threats and all the rest of it because she's an articulate Dalit woman. And, and I wondered whether you'd encountered that sort of horrific stuff as well. Yeah. I guess maybe the articulation and the abstract, maybe they kind of go hand in hand because I do, I think in my own evolution as an artist, I, it makes sense for me to think more abstract. And I, I'm not sure if there's, I, I mean, if, if I were more figurative, perhaps that's the expression I would choose. Um, and I think because maybe it's abstract, it's not, and I don't often talk about outright which materials I use or whether I'm, because I'm not sure if the intention is always there to provoke it just feels like it just there's things that just make sense which do not come from a conscious decision but just feel like a natural expression of the of the work you know when I read when I read the book I imagine it through these materials and that's just the the way that I think through the work and I think um I as as yet I mean I, I haven't actually exhibited in India yet and I'm, it will be very interesting to see the reception. I have, I mean, other than those two projects that I've done with fellow, like, the Lith artists, I, I haven't really been able to connect so much with the community because I think, as I was saying, the, you know, myself and the community, we, um, perhaps there's this kind of disjointedness in the art seen here and the community doesn't often we have we have kind of gatherings but art isn't part of and, and and that I think that will the more that I exist in this space the more that I will learn and it will be interesting to see in a few years how that changes as I do show work and how that will evolve and I have so much respect for Mina and people who do face this you know the, that it's it's so torturous but they have so much courage and I have a lot of respect for that um in terms of um, that caste discrimination, other than growing up, I mean, I have I have family who've experienced it more than I have, so I I can't say I've been, um, you know, I've, and even in showing it, I, I'm maybe once again maybe this will change as I continue to make work, and I have a lot of respect for my colleagues who do experience it, but I've not been as as yet on the heavy receiving end of that. Um, to answer your question, you go on. Uh, how were people engaging with it? I think a lot of people were curious about the uh, the context. A lot of people didn't get the context. It was quite an um. And I remember Kirtika and I talking about this just after after the show about how the audience at the show was, I think, largely an upper caste audience who hadn't really thought about caste at all. And then here they were in a room full of work about caste. Um, so I think they, like from the conversations, I heard them talking more about the aesthetics and the texture and the material rather than caste itself. And I think that might change the more artists like Kirtika exhibit and hopefully people will think more about caste. But I, it was um, mostly just in terms of pure visual rather than the actual context. Do we have any other questions from the audience? While the audience thinks about that, <laughs> let me kind of ask my kind of other questions. So, well, um, again, thank you both for kind of you know bringing this all kind of together so beautifully. It's so exciting to listen to someone who knows the art so well talk about it, because you know, just like Kirtika, I mean, I, I, I mean, I usually deal with words, but when I see artwork, I often become quite mute. 
You know, it's, I, I just don't feel like I, and I can translate words into words, but to translate something so visual, I often can't. You know, it's such a strong emotion. And I, I really was blown away by your work, which seemed to me kind of very rural in a way, but you seem to be such an urban person. <laughs> so I wonder kind of how that happened again. You know, these are not really questions, but I was interested. You mentioned that your, your father, when he was kind of really working through his anger, that he uh, spent some time in the, in the Ravidasi community. I was quite, or yeah, I thought that was quite interesting. I, I, I was kind of love to know whether that has been an influence on your work at all. And when I saw the the picture that was sort of inspired by Baby Cumberley's work, I mean, I could really see that. That doesn't make perfect sense to me, right? And I think that was like a perfect way of of putting that kind of the, the impact of that work in in into kind of a visual shape. I was wondering, have you done something similar to kind of any work by Ambedkar? Or you also mentioned Babu Rao Bagul. I mean, you seem to be interested, drawn to Marathi writers. Another little mini question there. Um, have you done, I mean, do you often do that? You kind of sort of translate one specific work into something visual that is also really personal to you? Or was that just a, a one-off? Sorry, I, I stopped now because. <laughs> yeah, of course. I think, um, I think Nicole, when I when I first started making art, it was um, using, it was a lot of text-based work using Ambedkar's writing. And that was my first way of understanding what caste was, is through his writing. And I, I the way that I processed that was through text. And I think um, just what Hugo was saying, I think that, that, you know, it started with that text and it kind of became more and more abstracted as I worked through that. Um, so the first few years, and I haven't, I, I also want to say that I haven't been practising for, you know, for decades. It's still quite, um, it's a very evolving process. Um, and and I think Dr. Ambedkar's work um, and his his writings really were my entry into understanding and also putting visual and, and starting to gather those materials. So that was very um, important and, and influential. And just um, in terms of what you were saying with the Guru Ravi Das Sabha, um, it, it, was, it was very important for my father. And I think when I do attend the gatherings, it always surprises me how many people in Sydney are part of this community and also the Ambedkar Art Society. There's there's just such a living and thriving and growing, you know. I, he was involved with it for over 10 years and in the time that I've seen that, it's the meetings are larger and larger and um, and I do and I have no doubt as the first and second generations we will be more involved in the cultural scene, not only in Sydney but, you know, in other parts of the world. Um, but when they do meet, they have incredible um you know the music and the the kind of feast and the togetherness is is something that that has actually surprised me because when we first migrated we were just one of the very few Indians in the area and to actually see how that's changed in some parts of Sydney and and not others but just to see that community grow is is pretty amazing and um yeah, and and it just ref makes me reflect a lot on how important these communities are in unpacking or understanding, um, and also examining what we have brought from it, what we've brought from India, and what we teach our children on about our identity. Yeah. 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 I think absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. I think these these forums of solidarity are so important, aren't they? And they kind of, you know, really sustain a sense of, you know, of celebrating the culture. So I really see that in your work. It's a celebration and rightly so, right? Because the work is so powerful and absolutely excellent. So I just, um, because no one will probably be able to see the uh, <laughs> the comments, I just want to record them. Um, um, someone said, Rocky Moore, that it was wonderful and informative. And thanks to the artists and organizers, the use of textures, materials and overall aesthetics are inspiring and hope to create more, you know, so supercharged and inspired. Yeah, and I think, you know, she speaks to, to all of us. That's how I feel, supercharged and inspired. So thank you all so, so much. And um, yes, we're, I'm excited to know that this has been recorded and that we can listen to it again and again. And I really, goodness me, I hope that I can see your work sort of in person, you know, and hopefully maybe we can bring you to the UK, huh? And, <laughs> and Nisha and I can <laughs> have a have a closer look at it because I would also love to see the textures 
But again, thank you both so much. That was just amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, and thank you to thank you to um, also hosting this, um, especially in Dalit History Month, and a very happy Dalit History Month to uh, everybody who's tuning in. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Seconded. <laughs> absolutely. Okay. Well.